her understanding clear by unidirectional or unilateral thinking, God is able to provide parallel multiple opinions. The next page. Whether he or she is able to relate, logically relate his or her multiple opinions, and at the end of it is extrapolate the thought process and do an unanticipated expansion which companies like ES4, Cambridge Analytica does using big data. Whether you will be able to predict. Yesterday I was attending a workshop on the future of learning. And during that workshop, it emerged an example of Sigmund Freud. Okay? Uh, and uh, also, uh, uh, it uh, came out another reference of Nostradamus. We still tend to cross check the prophecies of Nostradamus. Whether it is right, whether it has got some relevance, whether it has got some connection or not. We talk about that the future of learning is uncertain. Can big data analysis able to predict a little bit of it? We hear a lot about a myth there's a huge gap and what today's children think that the skill sets they have are fit for employability that's the academia's point of view that industry thinks to be different that's the single biggest challenge there's a huge disconnect I was uh, attending a, a talk by Microsoft Regional Director South Asia Microsoft has done a research with both challenge as data analysis and comprehension of the data which you have at hand. So moving on, so if you are able to figure out solo taxonomy, if you are able to see the problem, if you are able to motivate or drive children towards being independent thinkers, you know exactly what they are thinking and giving them the required support, you actually are on a journey of becoming a researcher. Analysis of your current situation. So that's the data collection. You collect data. Analyze. You do a stakeholder analysis as well. Again, when you are doing this, there are multiple stakeholders in an education system. And the talk is more and more that you stitch together the educational stakeholders. Even in the school system, school management, teachers, students, parents, which ultimately will feed up to the policy level. So stitching this is the stakeholder analysis. You do a self-actualization. So you collect data, you do a self-analysis of your own strengths. You do a very beautiful way of doing this, is do a SWOT analysis, a simple SWOT analysis of your teaching practice. Strength, weakness, opportunity, threat. Get a peer who knows, who's very close to you, who knows your teaching learning process well. Take a feedback. Be open for feedback. Discuss the weakness, discuss the threat areas. You will get a true picture of yourself. Try and put a camera inside your own classroom. Not to monitor students, but to monitor your teaching learning process. You will capture data. You may come back and think, I got the best possible class. This was my best class. Trust me, try it once. Your myth will be broken. You will find out n number of things, I won't say mistakes, n number of things which you could have done better. 
So that's your analysis of data. Now, when, whenever I'm talking about data, please remember the nature of data are different. Some are quantitative, some are qualitative. Then you do a mentoring and support. So the peer, which I said, comes as part of support mechanism. In a long-term plan, you can take help, you can find a guide for yourself, you can find a mentor for yourself, which will then feed to your purpose once again to see whether the cycle is completed. So this then gives you an idea as to now what I should invest my time and energy in terms of professional development. Now, we talked about why we talked about how. Now, the question is some tips as to what we should do. So, the last bit is what. This is a very simple mechanism. Don't worry, you can't read the pictures. Don't worry about the numbers, what is written. I'll explain this. This is a simple a sunburst chart, a chart format in Excel. But as I said earlier, your presentation of data is very important. How easy it is for you to understand. Let's say you are a school head and these are the total number of classes you have. Okay? These are the these individual sections are let's say each class multiple sections. Each of these you plot the average score of the students performance. In one snapshot you will get that which class, which section has not performed well. The average area which in this graph it is less of green and brown tells you that they collectively have performed the weakest. Once you get this data as a snapshot, you will be able to analyze or intervene or get deeper more easily. Again, coming back to that uh, analogy that if I give you for each class four files, each section one file, sections are over here more than that. You will not even take a look at it as a principal. I don't have time to do that. As a teacher, you teach the same subject, same class, three sections. These division of 10 can be reduced to 3. You do an analysis of your performance, which is actually the student's performance, of the three sections and try to evaluate what went wrong in this particular section. Okay, so it's how you take a look into the data points, how you comprehend the data and provide the call. This is again another one, especially if you do a, let's say, multiple choice question and all of you, all teachers are for preparing question papers. This is a sample taken from a very primary class question paper at um, a rural school in a government project which we had done. So here what happens is the exam went on in 10 different clusters. So we pointed out the average correct score percentage of each of the cluster and we mapped what were the total students' responses were for each of the options. So if you see A and C, I hope you have read the question, the girl is dashed the bicycle. So A is riding, which definitely is the correct answer, and C is driving. Majority of the students have given C as the response. That means there is a problem with the concept. Now, what we have done is we have done the analysis. So there is a difference in the analysis of the words ride and drive. So immediately when you get this, as a teacher, you know where your remedial classes need to focus on. Otherwise, still now what you are doing? 
the papers come, you check, give it back. Which is the most common mistake your class has made? Very difficult to find out. In terms of concepts. So these kind of analysis of the data helps you to do that. It also helps in setting benchmarks. So this is, let's say, another very, it's not legible, I'll just read off you know. This is a kind of exercise we have done in a particular school with teachers. And you see the four, but three, overall score for the entire school on 21st century skills was 3.5 out of 5. The pre-primary had 3.4, primary had 3.5, uh, sorry, this was primary, middle primary had 3.4, middle had 3.5, senior school had 3.6, and the senior secondary, sorry, that is activity, the activity teachers had 3.5. So immediately you can say that the senior secondary teachers, the senior school teachers have performed well. So from there you can find mentors for you. You can find potential leaders on 21st century skills who can feed back or who can guide you if you are a teacher at primary level. So that creates a culture of learning inside the ecosystem. That's what we call about collective teacher efficacy, John Hattie. 1.57 huge, 1.62 huge pre positive shift in the impact of learning. This is another one. If you map different skill sets, that was only for one skill set against different grades. This is different skill sets for one teacher. Now it's really, really sad to say that we go have for student performance, we still have, though India is not a part, we still have an international standardized system of PISA. We don't have an international standardized system to measure teacher efficacy. There's no system anyway. So you don't know, we are not supporting teachers enough without support, we are not helping them, we are not providing enough feedback to the teachers. So for that, you need to resort to some kind of a framework, some kind of an indicator which suits your context, which suits your purpose. And then when you map your teacher efficacy, there is a sample framework where we have learner management, how you are dealing with children, resource management, how effectively you are utilizing your resources at disposal, transaction of learning materials, your pedagogy, 21st century skills, asking the right questions whether you yourself are open or not, and professional culture. Okay? How are you dealing with parents? Whether you are punctual, whether you are rude to students, those come under professional culture. Then this is for teacher X. You will find that profit 4.2 out of 5 still has a certain journey to make to get into that absolutely mentorship mode. But it's good. But then if you see the red portion 3.2, which is transaction of learning materials, the teacher needs support on pedagogy. So that's, this framework gives you an idea that where your professional development should focus on. Because you have got evidence. Not perception. Principal tells you, you go for workshop A. You feel, no, no, I think I am best, I'll be best help if I go for B. If you do this kind of analysis, it might come out to C. No, no. So, another one is this area still is a 
of the research. What you can do with data analysis is help plan, guide students in the area of their career planning. How do you do? We talk a lot about 21st century skills. How do you measure them? It can't happen as a solitary assessment day for scholastic how we are happening, which is happening today. I can't tell sir, sir today you are an excellent, you, you, your collaborative scores are excellent, you are really a deep player, tomorrow you are not. Skill set, it's not knowledge. So for that, an easy way to do, I am aware of this two organizations who are still doing a lot of research in this area. One is Australian Council of Education and Research, who do a lot of assessments on 21st century skills. The second organization is Imagine Education in the UK, who is also doing a lot of implementation in the area of 21st century skills. Both these organizations, Imagine Education in particular, do something like this. They map their behaviors and they define the behavioral indicators. So this is not taken from any one of their framework. This is just we have created. So let's say let's let's discuss a little bit in detail of this one of these able to design work for a particular audience and the skill is communication and collaboration. So what is my indicator? The student is able to use level of language, different levels of language and different styles of presentation to suit the needs of audience. Today I tell <laughs> Suppose I am asking this student today that you need to present you are in class 7 you need to present this information in front of class 5. He has some presentation to make. Tomorrow I am telling him, same topic, you have to present it to class 11 students. Day after, same topic, you have to do the same presentation for your teachers. Will he be able to change his presentation to his usage keeping in mind the audience. If he can do that, he scores very high in this behavioral indicator. These are a few more. These can be defined by anybody. By any one of you, you understand the context, you will be able to define the behavior, you will be able to define the behavioral indicator, you will be able to define even sub-indicators of each behavior. So the indicator which I said can be divided further. Use of language, one. Use of presentation, one. Use of salutation, one. So multiple. The more granular it becomes, the better, the robust the framework gets. And how do you do this? Is it one time activity? The answer is no. No matter whatever you are doing with the particular child, that particular individual, you can actually note that data. After a certain period of time, you analyze that data. But data gets to be captured continuously. That's why going back to the acronym in the first slide, timely, automatic. Okay? 